Hi, my name is Bishop Lewis and I'm the Crime Prevention Coordinator for UPD. And today I want to talk to y'all about active shooter response. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years, and uh, but when I was growing up, and I don't mind aging myself at all, when I was growing up, um, all we did in school, we did like tornado drills and practice stuff like that. Uh, but unfortunately nowadays we live in a world where people think it's okay to go out in public and, and kill a bunch of people with guns. And so we have to have a plan. Uh, my dad was a police officer my whole life growing up and um, he told me this growing up and he really stressed it once I became a police officer. He said, buddy, when bullets start flying, if you don't have a plan, you're not on log. Uh, a lot of people don't know what I mean when I say that, but uh, to quote my dad, what he was talking about is a knot on a log is where a branch used to be on a tree and the branch died off and now there's a little knot on a, on a trunk. And when bullets start flying, you don't wanna be that knot because a knot on a log, it just sits there. It doesn't do anything to help, it doesn't move, it doesn't help the tree in any sort of way, it's just there. And you don't wanna be just there when bullets start flying. So we gotta talk about it. And what I want you to take away from this uh, presentation from this class today is two things. Uh, first, you feel like you have a plan. Uh, you may have to change it on the fly because every situation is different, but you have a plan that you can work with. And second, and most importantly in my mind, is you are going home. I'm talking about survival today. You have a reason to go home. Don't die today. We want everybody to survive if there ever were an active shooter on campus. Pray to God there's not, but just in case. So let's get started. The first thing we want to talk about in an active shooter or other violent emergency is to stay connected. So it's important to stay connected for a couple of reasons. One, if you're safe where you're at, you don't want to put yourself in risk or jeopardy by going somewhere that's not safe. So you want to stay connected. The other reason you want to stay connected is you want to let your family and friends know that you're okay during an emergency like active shooter. Some ways you can stay connected are the University of Mississippi Emergency website. Uh, there will be a banner uh, that changes uh, as we find information out. We'll be putting out uh, emergency alerts to the website. Uh, if, if you're an Ole Miss student, faculty, or staff, you should be enrolled in Rev Alerts that sends text me messages through your email. So if you, uh, just to make sure you're on that system, you sign into your My Ole Miss and you make sure that that's checked so you'll receive Rev Alerts. Emergency Management Rev Alerts have a Twitter page that it gets updated during emergencies like Active Shooter. I want to talk to you a little bit about LiveSafe. LiveSafe is a free app uh, and it's super, super important to have this app because LiveSafe is a free app. So what you do is you join uh, LiveSafe after you download it off of whatever app store you use. You join it with your Ole Miss email and then you join the Ole Miss community. And anytime an emergency or any other uh, important thing going on in the community comes through, there'll be an alert come through the LiveSafe app, just like Rev Alerts. So you'll be getting alerts on a couple of different uh, media platforms, which is important during an emergency. LiveSafe also has other features that are really great, like you'll be able to text or send pictures or videos to the police department. All right, the definition of an active shooter. Uh, it's one or more people actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. This is important later when we're talking about the plan and why you do some certain things or may not do certain things during an active shooter. But it, I just want everyone to remember that an active shooter, they're looking for groups of people, large groups of people to quickly and easily kill. And this is important. I want to talk briefly about Columbine High. Columbine High School Massacre is important for a couple of reasons. And uh, I always remember this because it happened the same year I started police work. It happened in 1999. Uh, it's important for two reasons. One, it's the first active shooter that gained national news attention. So the news put this out across the nation and said, hey, we're starting to have a problem with these things where people are going out and killing a bunch of people just out in the public. Uh, and so, it changed the way we started to handle that as law enforcement, which is the other reason it's important. At Columbine and prior to Columbine, uh, when something like this happened, regular police officers would call the SWAT team in, you know, the guys that had the extra training and all the equipment to handle something like an active shooter. The problem is that takes too long, and in the case of Columbine, it took 45 minutes before the first police officer went in the building. 
Now, if you think back to the definition of an active shooter, people are getting killed right now, quickly, uh, and we can't let that happen. So we have to go in now. Uh, and in the case of most police departments across the country now, uh, and of course I can't speak 100% for them because I don't work there, but I can say with 100% uh, certainty that every police officer at UPD is active shooter trained. So we don't wait around. We go and stop the killing as fast as we can, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. There is no profile of an active shooter. Uh, it's someone that's in a really terrible place in their life. Uh, they may have an Avenger or a revenge mindset. And nowadays, uh, they may broadcast their intentions on social media before they kill a bunch of people. And this is important. When we've gone back in law enforcement and looked uh, during investigations and looked at social media, before the attacks, we found, you know, manifestos of intention on Twitter. We found videos on YouTube saying what they're about to do. And this is important because it leads me to my next point. If you care enough about your own personal safety and the safety of your community, there are warning signs that you should report uh, that when you see and maybe will prevent an active shooter from ever happening here on the Ole Miss community. Uh, and so what I'm talking about here is not getting people in trouble. I'm talking about getting people help. Uh, if we can see something and we say something, maybe we get those people help and then they never become an active shooter. Um, I'll give you a real example and then we'll kind of go through the list of possible warning signs. A real example will be Sung Hoo Choi, the Virginia Tech shooter. He lived in the dorm room, and so a lot of times when I teach this class, it's to people who live in the dorm room, so this kind of hits home for folks. This is what I'm talking about. A few days before Sun Hu Choi killed a bunch of people living in the dorm rooms, he took a big kitchen knife and cut up all the carpet in his dorm room. Uh, that doesn't seem like healthy, happy person behavior to me. And so if I lived on the floor with that guy, I believe I would have told somebody, and maybe they could have gotten some help, and he would have never killed 40 something people at Virginia Tech. So that would be an example, a real world example, and to me those are the best, of a history of violence, right? So if you see something, say something. Here's something you might see. Uh, maybe your roommate or a friend has you know, starting to have a drug problem or an alcohol problem. You know, my wife's a biologist here on campus, and she's told me, you know, what this drug does to your brain chemistry or what too much alcohol does to your brain chemistry. And, you know, if you have an, a, a drug or alcohol dependency, it changes the way your brain works, and it it, it can affect how you feel about the world and how you judge things, how you perceive things. So it can lead to somebody becoming an active shooter. Mental illness, thoughts of suicide, uh, other, other psychological problems, we need to get folks help. We need to give them counseling. We need to give them accommodations and, and, and help, help them improve their quality of life and then hopefully prevent active shooter. Stalking, harassment, or threatening behavior, that needs to be reported all by itself. i got to say that. That's important enough. It needs to be reported all by itself because that is a crime that is dangerous for the victim, and, and of course, it will lead to active shooters. So. Isolation from others. As human beings, we're all supposed to have healthy, happy relationships where we have in, uh, good friends and enjoy our time with them and we love our family and we're connected, we value life. If you're isolated from others, however that happened, whether you chose to isolate yourself from others or whether you felt like you were left out by other people, you don't value life as, as, as much because you're not connected to it. So that can lead to, to other things. Declining class attendance and grades. If you're stressed out because you're not doing well in school, that just adds more stress to your life and that can, that can lead to, uh, along with these other warning signs, that can lead to problems that could, could potentially turn someone into an active shooter. I know when I was putting myself through school, if I wasn't getting good grades, I was really stressed out because not only was I not getting good grades, but I wasn't getting my money's worth. And I was working way too hard not to get good grades. So I can see how that stress could lead to, to, to a worse quality of life. And then finally, negative family dynamics or support. Uh, maybe the person grew up in a rough family or maybe they had a great family and then something tragic happened and that's put a lot of stress on them in their life. And so all of these things are warning signs. So just remember, if you see something, say something and let's try to prevent it as best we can. I want to talk about lockdown and shelter in place uh, for just a second because this is the way that the community is going to communicate an emergency like active shooter. So lockdown is the term that we use for active shooter incidents or other violent uh, man-made incidents, okay? Lockdown is different on Ole Miss campus. Uh, if you think back maybe to when you were in school, if you were fortunate enough to have, you know, a principal or school resource officers that had a magic button and they could just 
lock the doors down and uh, lock, actually put the school on lockdown, that, that's a good thing. Or if you've ever been somewhere where, where that was a, an option, that's a great thing to have. It really helps security. But Ole Miss is way too big. We have way too many buildings to, to have a magic button that locks all the buildings at once. So what lockdown means uh, during an active shooter is that you lock yourself down where you're at. You secure the area you're in as best as you can, and you keep yourself safe as long as you can. Uh, shelter in place is used for weather emergencies or other natural disasters like it's always been used. Hey, there's bad weather coming to campus. Seek shelter. Uh, that's how that's been used. And then finally, before we get into the planning, I want to talk about law enforcement's role during an active shooter. I mentioned earlier that nowadays we're all active shooter trained, and what this means is that our primary job is we go and stop the killing. We want to prevent the loss of life. We want to minimize it. Uh, and then we do these other things like secure the scene, evacuate the injured, and provide medical treatment. Now, realistically, what this means is that if we go into a building immediately, we're the first ones there, and we go into a building and we see people that have been hurt by the shooter, we can't stop to help because we have to go stop the killing. And realistically, if I, if I were a police officer going in a building and I stopped to help somebody and then the shooter killed me, now we're in a way worse situation because I was supposed to be stopping the killing. Now somebody else has got to come in that's going to take longer. Maybe they don't have the training and experience I do. So we got to stop the killing first and then we help everybody as, as safely and quickly as we can from there. All right. This is why we're here. This is the start of the plan. Avoid, deny, defend. Avoid, deny, defend. I've got an English degree from here at Ole Miss and the English nerd in me loves that avoid, deny, defend. It adds up to your survival. It adds up to you getting to go home at the end of the day. So let's talk about avoid. And y'all, I know a lot of what I'm about to say seems like common sense, but you've got to take it with a grain of salt. Remember, bullets are going to be flying around you. And unless you've been shot at before, you never know how you're going to react the first time bullets are, are going on around you. Okay, so let's just try to remember that we got to keep a cool head and we got to rely on our plan. So avoid the shooter if it's safe to do so. Situational awareness, that's a fancy way of saying know what's going on around you. Y'all, one of the first ways that I knew I was going to fall in, my wife, uh, fall in love with my wife all those years ago is on our first date, we went to the restaurant, and the guy took us back to seat us in the booth, and we, without me ever having to say a word, my wife said, hey, do you want to sit on this side of the booth so you can watch the door? And I'm like, oh, my God, I think I love you. <laughs> and I, I said it out loud because I'm a dork that way. But anyway, she's never teased me about situational awareness, about what want to know what's going on around me. So knowing your exits, secondary exits, places to hide, where the fire extinguishers are, all that sort of stuff is important. Okay, If you can safely avoid a shooter, that's what you should do. And that's where your situational awareness comes into play. Knowing your surroundings will help you avoid the shooter more effectively. Don't try to carry anything. Uh, don't waste time looking for stuff because anything you own is not more valuable than your life. So don't waste time. Accept your backpack, and this is specifically for students, or if you have like, you know, uh, some other large, you know, uh, piece of luggage or something like that with a lot of stuff in it, but mainly backpacks is what I'm talking about. If you if you have a backpack at your feet and you can remember to put, put your backpack on, this is great. Uh, if you have a few textbooks in your backpack or you have a laptop and a couple of textbooks, you're basically carrying around half of a bulletproof vest. Okay, they will stop a lot of bullets. We did some testing on this years ago and they will stop a lot of bullets. They'll stop a lot pistol rounds, it'll stop some rifle rounds, it'll stop some shotgun rounds, it's amazing. Uh, and y'all, the proof's in the pudding. Uh, a few years ago, five, six years ago now, uh, at the University of Florida, they had an active shooter in the middle of the day, and one of the students who had been through some training just like this remembered to put his backpack on as he was running away, and the shooter shot him in the back twice. Now, a few hours later, once the situation was under control, that student who had been shot was on the news going, hey, I just want to thank the police officer that taught me active shooter and taught me to put on my backpack because today it saved my life. So that's important. Backpacks are also going to be important in the next step of your plan for active shooters. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right. Once it's safe to do so, once you're safe, that's when you call 911. Don't waste time trying to call 911 when you're still in danger. You're not going to make a lot of sense if you're still in danger and bullets are flying around you. You may do something like drop your phone, which now is, you're in a worse situation. So just get to safety, then dial 911 as quickly as possible after that. Move quickly and keep your hands visible. Y'all, police officers are looking for 
people holding guns when we respond to active shooters. So if we see empty humans, you're not a threat, and we're going to tell you to go where we came from because we don't bypass danger. So we, we're not going to go past some danger uh, and, and then and not deal with it. So where we've been is safe. We're going to tell you go the way we came and, and get to safety and, and just follow our instructions. Okay, don't get in our way, please, because remember, we've got to go as quickly as we can and stop the killing. Now, let, I want to say one thing about avoiding, too. Um, this is a common question that comes up uh, during the void. Uh, if people are, say, in a classroom, a lot of times they'll say they're going to avoid the shooter by breaking the, breaking the window and climbing out. I'm not going to say that's always uh, a bad thing because, again, every situation is different, but here's some practical things to consider when you're breaking a window. First of all, window glass does not break as easily or as nicely as it does in the movies. That glass is special. That's called Hollywood glass. It doesn't work like that. Real glass, especially on exterior windows on commercial buildings, is thick. Sometimes two or three panes thick with like a rubber coating between them, just like the windshield on your car. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult to break, and it's going to make a lot of noise, which when we go back to our definition of active shooter, they're looking for groups of people. If they hear a lot of noise, that's going to tell them that there, there's a lot of people uh, where they hear the noise from. So you don't want to draw attention to yourself by making a lot of noise trying to break the glass. Some other things to consider about breaking a window is that real glass is sharp, like razor sharp, and it will cut you wherever it touches you. So there'll be big jagged pieces. And we just don't even need to worry about that. Now I'm not saying if that's all, if that's your only option, don't do it. Do what you got to do to go home, right? But this is just some things to consider. Okay, on to the next part of the plan. Deny the shooter access to where you're at. So if you can't safely avoid the shooter, you should deny them access to where you're at. All right? This is the you locking yourself down part of the plan. Okay. Now, if you're out in the open somewhere, and this is a question I get asked quite regularly, if you're out in the open, you've got to get to safety. Uh, so you're avoiding the shooter, but if you don't feel like you can completely avoid the shooter, then you've got to get to the nearest building that you're familiar with that you know that you can um, shelter in and that you can deny the shooter access. So deny the shooter access to where you're at. When I teach this in person to classrooms, uh, I tell them, all right, let's set this up. If we were in this room, how would we deny the shooter access? And what that usually looks like is that we're going to lock the door if we can. So you've got to pay attention when you're going to classes or when you're in your work environment. How does this, these doors that are around me lock? Do they open in or out? Do they have glass windows? Uh, what are we going to do about that? Okay, so lock the door if you can. Secure it as best you can. Pile a bunch of tables and chairs in front of the door. We barricade doors and other things for a couple of reasons. One, and ideally, it'll keep the shooter out. But two, if the shooter insists on coming into our space, it's going to slow them down. And we'll talk more about that in a minute uh, when we get to the next step of the plan. All right, close the curtains or blinds if you have time. This will keep uh, the shooter, if they're outside your classroom or office space, they'll keep the shooter from seeing in and seeing, seeing you and other people in there. If turning off the lights uh, makes a difference, do that. A lot of times when I teach this, uh, we'll be in big classrooms with big windows. Turning off the lights will be a waste of time because it's not going to get any darker. So it's about how much time you have and what's the risk versus reward, you know, to safely do it. So now we've, we've got to talk about the difference between hiding or concealment and cover. Hiding is better than nothing, but hiding won't stop bullets, okay? Now, unfortunately, very few things in real life stop bullets. A lot of brick and metal stop bullets, like concrete and metal stop bullets. A whole lot of water, like a bathtub full of water or more, and we don't normally in our regular day have access to that, so we're limited. Now, we talked about backpacks earlier. Cover is what stops bullets. Cover is the best thing because a lot of times you're hidden behind cover too, so you get both benefits. But cover stops bullets. As long as we're talking about active shooter, that's the most important thing. Now, if you're in a place that you know has a lot of things with metal and concrete, okay, you can get behind those. But let's say you're in a classroom or an open room or like an office or something, you've got to build cover. If you have a lot of backpacks and, and you're in class, you can build a wall of backpacks in the hidden corner of the room. And by hidden corner, what I mean is the corner like furthest in and out of sight from the door. So it's usually along the wall where the door is and away from the, the shooter. So it's the last corner in the room where the shooter will be able to see you. They've got to come all the way into the room to be able to see you. That's where you build your backpack wall. Now the problem with backpacks is once you stack more than two or three on top of each other, they fall off because they're not nice little boxes or cubes. So take a few 
rows of chairs or tables and build a framework. So build you a couple of rows of chairs, then you can stack the backpacks in between them on top of them or whatever. So as much time as you have to safely and quietly do it, you want to stack backpacks and build a wall, you know, two or three backpacks thick, four or five high, 10 feet long, whatever you have time to safely do, build your cover. And then everybody in the room hopefully can get behind that wall. Silence your cell phones or other devices, okay? Noise draws attention like we talked about earlier with the breaking windows. Silence them. Don't turn them on vibrate and then set them on the table because that'll make a lot of racket if it goes off too. Silence them completely. Now call 911 and here's the thing. Um, just like police officers need backup, everybody needs backup. Uh, I like to talk about the KISS rule because this is another thing my dad told me. The KISS rule means keep it simple stupid, right? I live my life by that. I'm a happy guy. So keep it simple. Two people should try to call 911 and what I mean by this is when one person's calling 911 they can't watch their own back. They can't watch their surroundings. They don't know what's going on around them. So have a partner have backup to watch their safety while they're dialing 911. Or maybe their partner sees that they're trying to dial on their phone and they're so worked up with adrenaline, their hands are shaking. Think back to a time when you've been scared and that happens. Your hands shake when you're really scared. So maybe your backup sees that happen and they say, hey, I'll dial the phone. You watch my back while I dial 911. So two people to dial 911. Keep people quiet and calm as possible. Okay, you need at least two people. Again, KISS rule, everybody needs backup. You need at least two people calming folks down. People who are panicked make a lot of noise and they make a lot of bad decisions. So you've got to have some folks that are good at talking to people and calming folks down. Give them something productive to do. Hey, go help build cover. Hey, make sure somebody's on the phone with 911. Give them something constructive to do to distract them and help keep them calm and quiet. And then if you're like me, you want to try to always plan ahead. This is the way my mind works, and this is, this is not a bad thing. This is a great thing. You should start looking for items that could be used as weapons because if you're already thinking about what I've got to do to defend myself, if the shooter comes in my shelter or my space, then you're ahead of the curve. And that leads us into the last part of the plan defending yourself against the shooter. You've got to defend yourself against the shooter. Now, this is worst case scenario. Ideally, you should have been able to avoid the shooter. Hopefully, that's what you should do because that's best case. Next, you should be able to deny the shooter access to your area. Hopefully, you can do that before you have to defend yourself. But we've got to talk about what to do if you have to defend yourself, if you're confronted face-to-face -face with the shooter. But you deserve to survive, okay? Your life and everybody else's life is just as important. You deserve to survive. Now, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, can I kill the shooter? And we're talking about self-defense here. In every state in our country, I don't care where from what part of the country you come from, if somebody's trying to kill you, you have a right to kill them if that's what you have to do to stop them from being a threat. So you have a right to defend yourself, all right? And you deserve to survive and go home, go home to your family. All right? If you're going to defend yourself against the shooter, you should place yourself as close to the door and against the wall as you can. You want the element of surprise. Right? I've got a minor in physics and distance equals time. If you're real far away from the door, the shooter is going to have more time to figure out what's going on and, and to start shooting at you. Uh, I know that's scary, but you got to get right up next to the door. Okay. And you need at least two people, right? Remember everybody needs backup, but three to five is ideal because you're going to need to, to deal with a, a few things. And that's what I want to talk about. I can't teach you some cool martial arts technique where you, you know, disarm the shooter and ah, you got the gun now, right? That's not how this works. That takes a lot of training over time with a bunch of different weapons and, uh, to get good at. So we're not gonna talk about techniques. We're gonna talk about things to think about. We're gonna talk about tactics and principles. So three things that you've got to consider if you're gonna defend yourself against a shooter. The first one is you wanna take away their mobility. And these three things, real quick, y'all, these three things are about taking away control from the shooter. You wanna gain control of the situation. You want the shooter playing catch up to you. You want the shooter behind the curve. Let me just say that, okay? Now, the first thing, take away their mobility. You do not want the shooter running around in the room, in the space that you're in, your office, classroom, whatever. You don't want them running around because then you just have to chase somebody who's shooting a gun at you, and that is never, ever, ever a good idea. Right? So you take away their mobility, and that gets back to why we barricade the door. If there's 15 tables and chairs in front of the door and they insist on coming into your space, They've got to either climb over all of that or stop and move it. And the whole time, they are not shooting at you and the other people in your space. So you have time now to deal with them. 
Next, as soon as you can get your hands on them, I don't care what it looks like. If you tackle them in the doorway, if you tackle them back out into the hallway, if you put them in timeout in the corner, I don't care. But do not let them run around in that room with the gun. That is super important. So you take away their mobility, right? The second thing I gotta talk about is their targeting system, right? There are ways that they pick people to shoot. You need eyes and you need a brain to think about shooting and killing people, right? So what you do is you distract them. Now you can't hesitate. As soon as you go, you go, and you don't stop until they are no longer a threat and you get to go home and you get to survive, all right? So as soon as you go, you go. You use, I said earlier, when you're knowing your surrounding situation awareness, you use whatever weapons you have available to you. One of my favorite ones is a fire extinguisher. That's why I always say, when I go places, I look and see where the fire extinguisher is. You can spray them in the face. You can hit them in the head repeatedly with the fire extinguisher. I promise you they won't be able to physically see who to shoot and they will not be thinking about shooting people. They'll be thinking about how bad their eyes are burning, how they can't breathe because they got some of that powder from the extinguisher in their mouth. They're gonna be thinking, ow, if you hit them in the head with it a few times. And listen, you, know, you hit them as many times as you need to to stop them from being a threat, okay? I said earlier, don't worry about whether you kill them or not. You have a right to defend yourself. You stop them from being a threat, okay? you go home. Um, I'm not advocating violence here, I'm advocating survival. Let's just get that out the way. Now, you will distract and divide their attention by doing this, right? So that's the importance of, of targeting, all right? You take away their ability to pick targets, right? The last thing I wanna talk about is their weapon. That's what makes them dangerous. That's what makes them a shooter. So you grab their hands to control where the weapon is pointed. I know a gun is a scary thing, but it can only hurt or kill what it is pointed at. And this goes back to the KISS rule, keep it simple, right? It doesn't matter what kind of gun they have, just grab their hands. They need at least one hand to hold a gun, so you just grab their hands. Then it doesn't matter what kind of gun they have, okay? And here's the thing. All guns, when they've been fired a few times, are really hot to the touch from the friction. Another thing to consider about grabbing a gun is modern guns, semi-automatic weapons, automatic weapons, they have moving parts that have sharp edges that will cut you like a knife, so you can't grab them safely there either. Just grab their hands. Now, one thing that will probably happen when you grab somebody's hands that are holding a gun, it may fire a few times because one of the hands you're grabbing is gonna be by the trigger. So get ready for that. As soon as you grab their hands and you control where the weapon is pointed, you point that weapon away from you and everybody else you're trying to protect, okay? Away. If that turns out to up and away, down and away, back at the shooter and away, if you're really lucky, just away from you and everybody you're trying to protect, all right? And then you can control where the weapon is pointed until you gain control of their mobility and you take away their ability to see and you gain control of them completely and you can take that weapon away. That leads me to my next point. Separate the weapon from the shooter and secure it away from them. I get asked this all the time. What do I do with the gun if I get it away from the shooter? Well, if they're still a threat, and you know how to use it, you do what you got to do to go home. But if they are no longer a threat, you want to get that weapon as far away from the shooter as possible because if they're still alive and they wake up, maybe you knocked them out with the fire extinguisher. If they wake up, the very first thing they're going to look for is their weapon or weapons, all right? Another question I get asked is, what if they have other weapons? Well, if you can safely disarm them or remove any weapons off their person, maybe they have some weapons in a bag, maybe they have a pistol on their hip. If you know how to safely remove the weapons, then you can do that. You should do that if you know how to do it. If you don't know how to do it, like take a weapon out of a holster, just leave it alone, right? That's the kiss rule, just leave it alone. Whatever you do, you should not touch the trigger. Don't try to take the bullets out of the weapon, again, unless you're specifically trained with that specific weapon. Every weapon's different. Don't mess with it. Here's the kiss rule. Just keep your finger off the trigger. Then again, it doesn't matter what kind of gun it is, right? Just keep your finger off the trigger. It's not gonna magically shoot itself, right? Get rid of the gun. Now, I suggest guarding the weapon, right? Everybody needs backup, so use at least two people, but three or four is better. And what I mean by guarding, let me set this up. You have two to four people eight or 10 feet away from the weapon between the shooter and the weapon. Now they're guarding it, okay? Hands visible, so when the police show up, there's no misunderstandings, and that limits who has the gun. Because you never know what people are thinking in the room, right? It could be some other uh, citizens in the room, and you don't know what's going on in their head, so we just don't need anybody messing with the gun. It helps us out in court, too, because it limits the number of fingerprints on the weapon. 
right? Now, once the shooter is no longer a threat, and again, whatever this looks like, maybe you knocked them out and drug them back out in the hallway. Maybe you knocked them out and tied them up and you put them in a corner and you're guarding them just like you are the weapon. Remember, three, four, five people, keep your distance so they don't get to jump on you, right? Maybe stay about six feet away and then deal with them if you have to, but hopefully you just have to guard them until law enforcement gets there, right? Then you re-secure your area. You re-barricade that door, you lock it if you can, you figure out how to make it better if you have time than the first time, right? Because there could be a second shooter, right? You wanna wait until law enforcement gets there. Now, last thing I wanna talk about, and then I'll go over a couple of last common questions that I get asked sometimes. The last thing you wanna think about is once you've re-secured your area, you stay in there until you can verify that it's actual law enforcement on the other side of the door. Okay, there have been actual active shooter incidents where people got tricked or baited or the shooter played on their emotions and those folks were doing everything right. They were secured in their area, they had the door locked, they were barricaded in, they had called 911, they did everything else to deny the shooter access and they got tricked or whatever into opening the door and then they got killed. It's very sad and unfortunate, but it's happened. So you do not open that door until you're 100% sure. And I don't care if you have to take a vote, but all hands gotta be in the air before you open that door. Now, the best way to verify for certain that it's law enforcement or the good guys on the other side of the door is going back to our first slide, which if you remember was about staying connected. If you're staying connected through social media and our websites, you will know when that all clear, it's safe to come out of your shelter as message comes through. So you'll see it, it'll, it'll look like something like, hey, UPD's you know, uh, got the situation under control, we, we've got the shooter in custody, or we've just, you know, we found out who the shooter is or whatever, it's safe to come out of your shelters. You'll see something along those lines. Uh, there'll be information about where medical is being provided, all of that, right? You wait until your social media platforms that you're monitoring says that, right? And I would personally wait until I saw that same message across two or three of the social media platforms just to be safe. Then you can come out of here. Now, some common questions I get asked about staying in your shelter until you know it's over. You're gonna be in there a while, so what should you have with you? It's best, if you can, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a regular basis, to have some water, have a few snacks, right? Have your medicine that you need with you at all times. That way you can stay sheltered longer, right? That's a common question I get asked. Another question I get asked, is what are some other ways that we could verify that it's law enforcement on the other side of the door, okay? Hopefully you're on the phone with 911 or UPD, so you could talk to our dispatcher and get our dispatcher to talk to us as law enforcement on our radios. And then you'll hear the guy you're on the phone with talking to you through the radio. So it kind of creates a communication loop. That's good, but I wouldn't leave it just to that. I've had people say, hey, we get the officer to slide the badge under the door. Sure, I'll do that. We'll all do that. doesn't matter. If we have time to safely do it, that's what we'll do. We'll tell you our rank, our name, who our chief is, where the PD is. You know, we'll tell you all kinds of stuff until you feel like it's safe to open the door, okay? Uh, I've had people say, hey, we're not going to say anything because you said earlier, noise draws attention. That's fine. Do what you think is best for your situation since every situation is different. and You stay safe and you go on. That's what we're talking about, all right? Now, um, one other question about the shooter. I've had people say, well, you talked about taking their weapons away from them. What if they had something that looked like explosives? What should I do? Well, you don't touch explosives. I'm not a bomb tech. <laughs> we don't need to mess with it. Don't touch it because you could accidentally set it off, right? If you see anything, you know, wires, Play-Doh, like this tannish gray Play-Doh looking stuff, if you see blinking lights, if you hear a beeping noise, Whatever, if you see some sort of like handheld switch, anything, anything that doesn't look right, get out of there. Go back to the first part of the plan. Avoid the shooter because now they're a threat again, right? And that's what I like about this plan. It's circular. It's cyclical. You can keep reusing it as many times as you need to. You can jump around to different parts depending on the situation. You use the plan how you need to use the plan so you get to survive and go home, okay? Now, um, that is really all the common questions that I get. Uh, I've talked about the plan, I've talked about you going home, and I just want all of you uh, to stay safe 
and uh, and thank you for your time uh, for Active Shooter. And this is the last uh, slide. I wanted to put the sources up here, the University of Mississippi website, and uh, Alerts Craze, Civilian Response to Active Shooter. Look those up. We also have a video on the emergency uh, uh, emergency.olmiss.edu website with uh, an active shooter. It's great for a refresher in case you uh, need to say, hey, what was the plan again? It's got to avoid deny and defend on there. So you can go back and refresh it. It's not a super long video. It's like five minutes long. So um, watch that every now and then to stay up on your plan. Uh, again, thank you for your time. And um, please contact UPD if you have any questions or, or concerns or you want to do any follow-ups to this training. Thank you.